Gula, you know, I've been thinking about this, but before we get into it, I just want to maybe ask uh, both of you, like just the, how do you frame these, these principal vices just in your own work and uh, dealing with um, obviously moral philosophy? How, how, how does that fit in uh, as a structure? I would say that I deal with vices or sins always as parasitic upon virtues. They're always they're the disordered virtue. So uh, it's really important when we talk about, about gluttony to think about fasting because gluttony is the corresponding vice to the virtue of fasting. And so it's, it's, the, it's the virtuous life. It's that movement from purgation to illumination that, uh, that is the center of sort of the, the, the journey of Christianity, of the spiritual life. And it's the, the corrosiveness, the disorderedness of that process uh, where the language of sin and the language of the seven, in particular the seven deadly sins, comes up. Yeah, I think that would probably um, be my approach as well. I come from uh, a background in what's usually called virtue ethics. And so um, anything is, you know, talk of sin is always going to be um, uh, parasitic on virtue. And and one thing that was always drummed into us was seeing the interconnection amongst the virtues, and I think you can say the same thing, the interconnection among the, the vices as well. Um, and I think during our conversation we'll probably be drawing lines between uh, gluttony and other kinds of vices as well. And the kind of social nature of sin, um, I think, is something that has, you know, is a, a kind of ancient idea and a biblical idea, but one that has kind of been re, uh, recaptured and reformulated in the 20th century. You know, Karl Rahner's famous example of the banana, you go and buy a banana for breakfast and suddenly you're enmeshed in all of these kind of structures of, of sin um, uh, that you, you don't necessarily uh, intend. In dealing with each of these seven, it, what's been fascinating to me is thinking about the grip that our culture uh, is in um, with these vices. And it's very interesting to me that um, gula or gluttony, um, there were m many theologians that considered it really the first, you know, what got us out of, uh, of, of, our, of our, our first state of, of innocence and uh, blessedness. It's interesting in the Islamic tradition, it's not an apple tree, it was actually wheat that uh, all, the, all the commentators say was the first, uh, the, the forbidden fruit. It was actually uh -huh. grain. Um, but uh, whatever that was, you know, it seems to just have a real grip on our culture. And I, I know that, uh, that you have a lot of thoughts about consumption and uh, it seems that it's consuming us. Uh, this, you know, this idea of, of gluttony. Uh, well, it, it's not an apple in the Bible either. It's a, it's just fruit. Um, it, the apple kind of comes comes as a kind of later eisegesis. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in some ways, in our culture, um, sin and guilt are still associated with food uh, in some interesting ways. And in some ways. Um, Although we don't tend to take sin very seriously anymore, um, you have these, you know, you have the guiltless gourmet, and you have, um, in, in some ways, uh, under the category of food and drink, sin is taken uh, more seriously than it is, than it is in, you know, uh, sexual sins and so on. Lust is hardly a sin anymore. It seems like it's a it's a desirable, um, uh, it's something that you need to take pills to keep, keep going and so on. Um, but, but this idea of sin with regard to dietary things uh, seems like something that uh, is, is very tenacious. Although in some ways, in, sometimes in our culture, it gets turned around. And so to call a chocolate cake decadent uh, or to say that something is sinfully delicious um, that so it's still associated with sin, but but um, but it becomes a positive thing uh, in that way. I guess what I want to say is that in our culture, the 
things have been so turned around that the sin of gluttony is paired with this odd sin of fasting as well because uh, there's this radical swing between you know these clen juice cleansing diets and then these debauched evenings and so 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 many in the in the kind of cultural currency that we operate in uh, especially young people or the people that I teach right uh, they just swing from one extreme to the other and don't understand even the, the sort of Aristotelian infrastructure of the language of, of mean, of, of temperance, you know, the, the Aquinas on temp temperance, Aristotle on, on virtue. It's just a lost currency. And so I think we've got this out of whackness both on the fasting and on the gluttonous. Right. Um, you know, one of the popular diets apparently now uh, with the celebrities is what they call the 5-2 where they, they can eat whatever they want for five days, and then for two days, they, they restrict their caloric intake to like 600 calories, so they kind of starve themselves for two days. But again, it, it gets to that point like, so that I can eat whatever I want and not gain weight. And I think one of the things that fascinates me, um, and Aquinas talks about this, uh, he mentions it in his section on, on uh, gluttony, about the, the five aspects of gluttony. And I, and I think people really don't think about, when they think of gluttony, they think of the obese uh, person that's like just eating uh, enormous amounts of food and getting fatter and fatter. But um, he mentions a, a little mnemonic that they used, uh, pre prepare laute nimes ardentor studiosi, and, and saying basically that it was uh, too soon you know, too hastily, too expensively, uh, or sumptuously, uh, too much, too eagerly, and making too much of a fuss, uh, fastidiousness, which fascinates me because, what, and C.S. Lewis mentions this, I think, in the, in the screw tape letters, that once uh, the, the demons realized that people uh, recognized that overeating was, was a, a bad thing, they switched their strategy to get them... Uh, into the kind of the gourmet as opposed to the gourmand, you know, the, the person who it's everything has to be just right and I'm going to send um, my latte back because it's not at the right temperature. And, and I think that aspect is really lost on a lot of people that in some ways, I mean, I felt, you know, really reading a lot about this and, and thinking about that I, I could see the gluttony in my own uh, life in certain instances, and, I, and I, I don't think people think about that aspect of gluttony. I'm so glad you brought up uh, Aquinas, as you could imagine, uh, because I went back and read Aquinas on gluttony and on temperance and fasting as well to prepare for our conversation this afternoon. And what was really striking to me was how, uh, how, the, how embodied Aquinas' theology and philosophy is that uh, gluttony is not one of the worst vices, one of the worst sins at all. It's like the second to last, right? It's, it's, it's not at all, it's not pride, for example. Pride is, is, the, is the worst for him. And yet, when you overeat, what he calls the daughters of gluttony, the six daughters of gluttony, right? right. Overeating then leads to, and it's a capital sin, and it's not so much a sin on its own account, but it's a sin on what it leads you to do. Right. Um, so overeating or over drinking leads you to speak too much, to lose. Oh, what is he? He's got this great line through reason um, that you operate as the reason we're fast asleep at the helm. I think that's so beautiful. You know, uh, I mean, it's not beautiful, but it captures something, right? Right. Um, you, there's scurrility, a levity resulting from the lack of reason. I mean, I just think of high school boys. I mean, it's just, you know, it's sort of the the. Um, the immaturity that results because of a disordered reason and a disordered sensitive appetite, uh, that it's, it's, it's the opposite of fruitful, right? And right. yet it's, it's sort of, it gives forth, it's, it's a ripple, there's a ripple that comes from it. I think scurrility really struck me because the obscenity, because it has both foolishness but also crudity and, and, and obscenities and things. And I, th I think about our culture and how crude it has become. And I mean, I think we're all old enough to, to remember when 
I mean, swearing has always been around, but you certainly never swore in public or in front of, I mean, nobody would think of, uh, of speaking the way. And I'm just wondering how much of that actually originates in this problem that we're looking at. I want to return to what you were talking about with um, gourmet, uh, um, you know, the, the, this kind of emphasis on uh, specialization in food, because uh, that's something that I'm guilty of uh, as well. You know, if I can bring a kind of exotic cheese home from some place I've traveled to or something, you know, um, there, there just seems to be, this is part of the whole process of globalization too, I think, is that this incredible variety of things from all over the world is now at the fingertips of those of us who have, you know, the the means to uh, to attain it, um, and uh, it makes me wonder what is the difference between um, this kind of gourmet life and um, and feasting, you know, because there is a a place in uh, you know all, all of our traditions I think for for feasting. And I think about the the film Babette's Feast, you know, where you have um, you, you in this beautiful kind of Christological and Eucharistic image, you have this um, French chef spending uh, her entire windfall from a lottery, I think, um, on serving one incredible gourmet meal to these very uptight Danish Puritans who r- refuse at first anyway to really enjoy it. Um, but then the, the kind of beauty of it and the gift of it comes forth and they begin to reconcile with one another. And it's this very Christological image of kind of the self-sacrifice of Babette for others. And so um, it, it seems to me um, the the different i mean there's a few differences there one is that feasting is it evokes gratitude and whereas we tend to be very kind of ungrateful for the food uh, that we have feasting is occasional and and um gluttony is habitual um and there's also something about status too i think that um there's this um feasting is meant to kind of bring a community together and celebrate these social ties. Um, and that can certainly happen with these kind of gourmet meals, but oftentimes uh, it's meant to exclude the poor uh, for one thing. And also it, it tends to be about status. You know, um, look at this exotic food that I discovered that you didn't know about um, that now I can, you know, lord over you and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, it seems to me that there's something uh, really important about making that distinction because feasting, of course, is something um, that kind of comes along with fa- fasting in all of our um, uh, traditions, uh, and it's important to kind of uh, hold on to that. And that's something that you know is is an image of heaven, uh, this tremendous feast. Um, uh, but on the but it just seems to have a very different spirit uh, about it than uh, this kind of gourmet gluttony. Yeah, I I think I'm glad you brought that up. the The fifth chapter of the Quran is is named after the Last Supper, which which in in the Quranic narrative it's it's a miracle that actually the table spread is a miraculous event, and um, I think. Uh, our religions have this, uh, at the end of the fast, there's a breaking of the fast. And uh, both of the, in, in, in the Islamic tradition, both of the, what are called the Eids, which are the celebratory uh, 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 holy festivities uh, that Muslims do twice a year, both of them are celebrated with food. Um, one is the end of Ramadan, but the other is uh, sacrificing and distributing a third of the meat to the poor. You, you know, you give you give a third of the meat to the poor because meat was not people people didn't eat. But one of the things about uh, that I think that a lot a lot of people tend to forget, and what you're bringing up is that people really did not have a lot of food, and and so these festive days were they were respite from uh, from just not eating a lot. I think people ate a lot less. Uh, than people do today. We, we seem to consume far more than we need. And I think that's 
where gluttony really is the inordinate uh, desire. There's another aspect that I, I'd like to bring up, which is ends and means. And one of the things that I've noted, um, it actually initially bothered me because people turn uh, transitive verbs into intransitive verbs. Um, but, you know, I noticed uh, at a certain point, people started, you know, your waiter would say, enjoy. And uh, that became widespread all over. And, and one of the things that the Quran talks about is saying, tamatta'u, like enjoy, eat, eat and drink and enjoy. In other words, if, if that's what you're going to do with your life, but it's actually a warning in the Quran. And in traditional societies, they always said things like, like in, 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 in the Arabs always say, with health and well-being, or, the, or salud in, 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 in Spanish. So they were looking at the end of the food and not uh, I mean, at the means of the food as, as, as a means to an end, which is health. Whereas our culture seems to have turned this means into an end in and of itself, which seems to me to be the essence of gluttony, where the, the final cause is corrupted. And, uh, and, I, and I, just, I find it fascinating that uh, it's just so widespread, this idea of enjoy, you know, uh, bon appetit, you know. How, <laughs> so I just, it was something that really struck me as a change from when I was younger. As Augustine says, God is to be enjoyed and um, everything, created things are to be used, and which sounds like a terrible uh, sort of killjoy thing, but what he means is precisely this idea of means and end, that God is the end, that our life in God is the end, and, the, and everything else is a kind of uh, means to that end, which can be very beautiful and and it can mean a kind of sacramental view of the world that all of these beautiful, rich things that we have, the created things, um, are to be um, appreciated for the way that they, you know, image the the beauty of God. Um, but, it, but but they can become idolatrous then when when they become an end uh, in themselves, and the 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 creator is is forgotten. Can I bring up fasting? Because yeah. I think it's really important when we're talking about uh, gluttony to just to talk about fasting because if, if gluttony is maybe one of the markers of our age, we, we've got a complete, we're completely, uh, we have no idea how to fast, how to fast appropriately, what fasting means, what fasting means in the spiritual life. In those, in that question on fast, you know, Aquinas asks whether it's one. One of the objectors asks whether it's a. It's a. Um, whether fasting, with the church requires certain fasts throughout the year, whether that's against Christian liberty, and he answers that it's actually in favor of Christian liberty because what does fasting do? Fasting trains you to moderate your passions, to harness your passions. It's got a real. It's got a. Um, a real role in the spiritual life. It teaches you, if you, if you do regular fasting, it teaches you to not be gluttonous in itself, right? And therefore, it bridles, in bridling your passions, it opens it up, it opens you up to Christian liberty, to becoming truly free in the, in the sort of expansive sense, as in free to be who I was meant to be, free to, to, to resp respond as in yes to uh, to God, I think, and as I read over those questions, I just, it's, it's true that for me, I've completely lost the practice of fasting. I used to, as a child, uh, before receiving the Eucharist, also uh, during Lent on Fridays, in a much more real way than I do now. Now it's, it's almost like a cultural thing, right? It's not, it doesn't actually, um, maybe I'm being too autobiographical and conf confessional here, but uh, well, it's, it's <laughs> but it just but it just really struck me how tone deaf I am to the practice of fasting and how important it is to the spiritual life, to the Christian to Christian living. We, you know, uh, Muslims fast. Uh, obviously, Ramadan. I mean, you've taught Islamic courses and things, so you're very well um, versed in that. 
but uh, they fast, you know, we fast in the lunar month. So it, it's very interesting. It changes, it shifts throughout the year. So right now it's, it's, they're pretty long in the, in the, in the winter, they're, they're quite short. Um, but, and somebody worked out that uh, around the world, if, if, if you live about 70 years, everybody's going to fast around the same number of hours, irrespective of where they are, unless they're in the real extreme places. Well, if we're being autobiographical, I, I'm a terrible faster um, because fasting just makes me think about food. And so <laughs> I, I, tend to, um, I tend to not do it very well. Um, I do an experiment on a, a, asceticism with my students. I teach a course on Christianity and consumerism. And uh, we do an experiment uh, in asceticism that lasts for three weeks. It's actually based on something that I picked up from a, another professor at East Carolina University. Um, he calls it the monastic project. But basically it's three weeks in which students go without uh, internet, uh, cell phones, earbuds, uh, meat, alcohol, sugar, um, artificial ingredients of any t kind, and, and I, do, I do this with them, and it includes periods of modified silence and, and mindfulness and, and so on. Uh, and for the students that usually, it's voluntary, usually about half the students in the class will do it. And for the ones that make it through three weeks of this, it really becomes, uh, can become transformative uh, for them and liberating. You know, Anna, you were talking about how this, it, it frees you frees you up, you know, um, by bridling the, one of the passions that kind of frees, uh, frees you up. And, you know, students will make comments. One young woman said she hadn't heard birds chirping since she was a little girl because she walks around with uh, earbuds in all of the time. And it just kind of breaks you open and opens you up to experiencing the world as a gift rather than something that is constantly available and constantly manipulable. And, and I really think that in some ways um, that's the most effective pedagogical thing uh, that I do is kind of return students to their bodies, all of these ways that we are kind of disembodied uh, in, in our culture. It, this exercise in asceticism kind of returns us to our bodies uh, and um, in, in, in that kind of humbling exercise sort of opens ourselves up to all kinds of other uh, experiences, plus just the freedom of being able to do, finding that you can do without things that you didn't uh, think you could uh, do without. You know, Thoreau said a person is wealthy in proportion of the things they can afford to do without. And right. I think that's a great kind of... Um, uh, definition of wealth and a good way to think about some of these kind of issues. Yeah, that's that's very interesting because I, in Ramadan I always completely shut out all, I you know no internet, no uh, no no media. I, I really go on a media fast, and it's it's always a very interesting experience. Which which I think brings us also to this idea that that gluttony is not just about food. That that it, that it really yeah it's about a hunger, um, and and that hunger uh, is is you know people are attempting to satisfy it in different ways and certainly uh, food is is one way I mean people a lot of uh, people talk about um, when they get depressed they 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 tend to eat uh, a lot or eat things that they know are bad for them uh, and and um, it, it it becomes a, a like some kind of source of, I, you know, I think it's pseudo nourishment. It's obviously not real nourishment, but, but it gives them some kind of temporary solace from whatever emptiness they're feeling. So I, I think that's a really uh, interesting exercise to do with your students. I mean, I, I hadn't made the connection between gluttony and consumerism uh, before, but in some ways, it's the it's the one of the seven deadly sins that most closely corresponds to um, this kind of broader phenomenon of uh, consumerism. Avarice is not really the same as consumerism because consumerism is really not so much about possessing things and clinging on to things. It's more about the consumption of things and the moving on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. You know, right. um, it's really it's not. 
it's not buying, it's shopping that's the, the kind of focal point, the kind of spiritual heart of, of consumerism. And, and that seems to me to be, be part of what's being captured by this idea of gluttony is that it's, it's, it's never being satiated. It's always kind of moving on to the next thing. It's what the, um, a, a leaked memo from General Motors Corporation called the organized creation of dissatisfaction. They were talking about changing car models every year, um, which is not strictly speaking, or especially back in 1948 or whatever it was, not really necessary, but you want to continually create dissatisfaction with the current model and, and you know, moving on to the next thing. And that seems to kind of be, be part of the spirit of um, gluttony as well, that, um, you know, our hearts are restless, as Augustine says, um, and then instead of the second part of that, which our hearts are restless until they rest in you, God, um, our hearts are just restless and we're always dissatisfied with things. But instead of moving on to God, we just move on to the next thing, whatever, you know, the next kind of iPhone or the, I don't know how many razors we're up to now, but, you know, the double bladed razor came out in the 70s, I think, and then the triple bladed razor, and now, the, you know, the quadruped now there's five and so on I mean it's 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 this constant sort of dissatisfaction that the hedonic treadmill is what psychologists talk about right you um, you adjust your satisfaction levels to whatever it is that you have um, and then you become dissatisfied with it and you're con on this kind of constant uh, treadmill to, to to move on to the next thing I think as as you were speaking Hamza I was thinking about what moral vocabulary is operative in our culture right now and it seems to me it's the language of the therapeutic so uh, if there's any language that speaks to students it's the oh you can't medicate with food or you can't medicate with drink you've got this deeper problem that needs to be resolved on the therapist's couch and I, I'm not trashing therapy here it's just that there's been this overlay of the therapeutic on what sh is properly deeply religious and spiritual but since we've lost the core spiritual vocabulary the only vocabulary we're comfortable with is the therapeutic and it's just it's 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 very surface it's not i'm not again i'm not saying all therapy is surface but but this therapeutic language i think doesn't get at the heart of what we've been talking about this afternoon with gluttony yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. And I think one of the things, there's a hadith where um, the companions said to the prophet, peace be upon him, that he said, we eat, but we don't feel satiated. And he said, perhaps you're eating alone. And they said, yes. And he said, come together, bless your food, and, and, and there will be grace in the food that will satiate your hunger. And so that brings us to the communal aspect of food and perhaps a lot of the the gluttony. I mean, I I actually I I really feel like our culture is starving to death. Mostly, I think a lot of uh, people because we have um, food that's not nutritional, uh, and and the processed food has it doesn't have micronutrients. So they actually the cells of people are hungry. People and so they're eating more and more because. The food is so denatured. It's, it's just bad food generally. But there's also, uh, in our tradition, the demons, when you don't bless the food, the demons eat with you and, and, and they get stronger from that. So their food is our heedlessness. And, and so when you bless, grace was just so fundamental to uh, global civilization, the idea of the blessing of food and the blessing of the community that goes with eating. There's a, to a, a tradition in, in Catholic social thought about the social mortgage on property um, that kind of captures uh, some of this as well, that um, Part of what gluttony means in our society is the idea that if you have money, you can spend it on whatever you want to satiate your own desires. And um, the idea that there's a social mortgage, uh, again, an idea that comes from Aquinas, right? Uh, and 
predates a, a Aquinas as well, but the idea that you, you, everything belongs to God and we're just using it and um, private property is allowed but only insofar as it serves the common good. And I think a lot of that gets lost in our um, society's kind of gluttony that you, if you make $150 billion, um, you are entitled to spend it however uh, you want. And if you want to spend it on um, you know, luxuries uh, for yourself, then there's no, there's no judgment uh, upon that. And I think that's a that's a huge issue. Um, the the distinction uh, between the the divide between rich and poor uh, is such a huge issue, uh, precisely uh, because of that. That we don't think that our consumption needs to feed the common good, but it's it's a kind of private, a private sort of uh, consumption. We t spoke earlier in our conversation. I think Bill, you brought this up about the social nature of the virtuous life uh, and how the, the vices really are related to. And this is just striking me now as I've been listening to both of you because I think there's just a, just a radical epidemic of loneliness on college campuses. Uh, and gluttony is, is related to that the vices that are at work on college campuses cause this loneliness um, because the sin of gluttony, it's, it's all self-referential. Self it's not, it's, it's oriented within, it's not oriented to the community. Bill had that, uh, talked about that great story, Babette's Feast, right? Uh, where it's the opposite. Feast is the opposite of gluttony. And it seems to me that it's just striking me now that gluttony leads to loneliness in a very real way. I think that's related, Anna, to the point you were making before about the therapeutic uh, way we tend to think about these things too, is that it's, it's all in very individualistic sort of terms and terms that have become uh, medicalized. And, and there are some good things about this. We don't you know, have a tendency to kind of uh, blame uh, people f who are obese or struggle with anorexia uh, or alcoholism. Um, I, I think we're uh, we're right to to not just you know say well that's just sin and um, and you're a bad person. Um, but if you swing too far the other direction, then you take away people's agency. Um, is one problem with that, and then and you and you don't have a, a means to integrate that suffering with their spiritual life, um, or with with talk of uh, of agency. We we you know an alcoholic uh, may be you know does not have um, free will, uh, but it's. It's not that they're alcoholics because they have no free will. They have no free will because they're alcoholics, right? That this is a, it's it's part of what the disease ta takes away, and we we've gotten very bad at talking about um, people's agency and and people's freedom. And the other thing that that therapeutic uh, model does is it it tends not to consider the larger larger kind of social. Um, uh, implications of what's going on, right? Why do so many people have uh, eating disorders uh, now? Um, why are people uh, so addicted to drugs and so on? Well, let's talk about, um, you know, unemployment in places like West Virginia where you have these rampant, you know, fentanyl uh, addictions. Let's talk about the actions of the pharmaceutical companies um, you know, let's uh, let's talk about uh, an economy, the the kind of larger economy that kind of sucks the meaning out of out of people's lives, so that they search for meaning in food and drugs and whatever it might be. Um, and I think a lot of that gets lost in this uh, therapeutic uh, model. Well, I I also I mean, don't you think that part of the problem with the therapeutic model? is it denies the supernatural uh, element that enables people to overcome uh, these addictions. 
we can't do it on our own. I mean, I think that's one of, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, the scholastics saw that gluttony came out of pride because, and the, the pride that was involved in it was this idea that you, you could satisfy yourself, that through food, that you, that, you know, it was all up to you. And, and not seeing that it's only God that can do that. And I think the success of the 12-step program, which nobody wants to really talk about, you know, in that therapeutic world, is that it is acknowledging that I can't do this on my own. I am helpless. When the cheesecake comes, because they've got, uh, you know, food addicts anonymous and things. When the cheesecake comes, I can't help myself. And... The truth is we can help ourselves and removing that moral agency, I think, is one of the worst things that our culture does. But if if they don't understand that the moral agency is helpless without the help of the one that created that moral agency, I think that's, for me, at the heart of this whole crisis. There's a very another interesting thing that uh, made me think I, I read something about, you know, and, and I just like your your uh, thoughts about this. Uh, the argument, there's a book on, on, uh, on the seven uh, deadly sins, but the argument that he made about gluttony was he gave an example of like if you had a $500 pair of shoes and, uh, and then you saw some kid drowning in the lake, but you, you didn't want to dive in to help them because it would ruin your $500 shoes. He said everybody would condemn that. And yet we don't condemn all the wastage when we have so many people that are hungry, uh, for instance, and the amount of food that we waste and things like that. That, that was his analogy. And I was thinking about a tradition where uh, this, the second caliph Omar once saw a man that had quite a girth and he, w- he was making tawaf around the Kaaba and he stopped him and he, and he lifted up his, um, his uh, you know, they wear this ihram, which is just two, two cloths. And he lifted it up and tapped his stomach. And he said, that would be better if it was on somebody who needed it. (laughs) You know, which it's interesting because we actually don't need a lot of food. And and now we know because of the science that that your body actually will adjust to as you as you diminish your calories, the body gets more efficient at using the actually caloric intake that we do. And the Prophet Muhammad said, he said that it is enough for a child of Adam to just have uh, morsels, uh, a small number of morsels to keep the back straight. But if you have to, and, and this is like, this is like, if you have to, then, ne- then have one third of your stomach with food, one third with drink, and one third for air. It, it, you know, and that's one of the things that people... Uh, you know, at these Thanksgiving, I, I worked in an ER uh, in a previous uh, lifetime. lifetime. Uh, I was an RN. But one of the things that you would see on like Christmas and Thanksgiving is people coming in with shortness of breath from overeating, like just you know, they had eaten so much. So, I, you know, I think about that. I mean, any thoughts about that? Just about just these disparities that we have. Part of the, I mean, it's even worse in some ways than just eating whilst others go hungry um, because it's oftentimes our eating that makes others go hungry. And what makes it even worse is that we've been sold uh, an ideology which says that our eating actually uh, satiates their hunger. Right. I mean, that's the whole idea of, um, you know, our consumption creates jobs for others and so on. And so um, the invisible hand of the market makes sure that, you know, uh, everybody pursuing their own interests and their own desires is going to, you know, work out for the the best for everyone. And and it's interesting in, in, you know, luxury is a, a kind of category uh, that's criticized up until in economics up until the 20th century, and then it kind of drops out where you get this idea that any kind of consumption is, is good consumption because it feeds others, uh, basically. Um, whereas the truth is almost exactly uh, the opposite, right? We, um, especially in days of online shopping now, um, 
all of the focus is on the product and the people are invisible. So you, you click and something, an object magically appears on your doorstep uh, and you never see who made it. You know, the girls in Thailand making 40 cents an hour uh, making it. You don't see the people in the Amazon warehouse. You don't see any people at all. All you do is click and then it materializes on uh, your doorstep. And so our, it's, the whole system is set up in some ways to make sure that we don't see people, that all we see are products, right? This is what Marx talked about when he talked about uh, fetishism of commodities, right? right? It's everything is, you know, the Amazon boxes with smiles, you know, the, the objects become um, personified and the people are dehumanized. And this is, you find this in the scriptures as well when, when they talk about idolatry, you know, that, that people um, animate inanimate objects and then become uh, disanimated um, themselves. They become mute and dumb as, as the idols that they make, um, you know, Psalm 115, uh, for example. And that gets to the heart of, um, the, you know, Lewis Mumford's remark that our entire economy now is driven on the seven deadly sins like the the whole the whole apparatus of of market economy is driven by selling people's weaknesses you know it's it's really selling to them their weaknesses i think one of the hallmarks of traditional societies is they recognize human weakness and they and they, they the societies were set up to try to help people overcome them and i don't i don't think that's a nostalgic view um, because I've lived in societies where it's still like that um, in West Africa. And, but now it's like, it's obey your thirst. You know, it's the hero sandwich. Uh, it's what you said, you know, sinfully um, delightful. All these, there's, they use uh, these human weaknesses and, and really prey on them uh, with an E. Um, you know, but I mean, this is this is a real, uh, I think, uh, hallmark of our culture is just this um, incredible uh, market driven economy that, you know, consumer was, as you know, I, I know you know this, Dr. Kavanaugh, consumer was one of the names for the devil. Um, and and there, there's a verse in the Quran that says um, that those who are spendthrifts are brethren of the demons. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the verses in the Quran about human beings is that they say, I have consumed boasting. I have consumed vast quantities of wealth. And so the conspicuous consumption, I mean, you were talking about luxury. That's something that, you know, Veblen identified uh, s several decades ago, this idea of conspicuous consumption, which which in most societies, first of all, they didn't want the evil eye uh, because they, you know, people actually believe that um, if, if they saw somebody that had something that they envied or somebody, they could actually harm them. I mean, even Aquinas talks about the evil eye. But uh, Socrates warned of a, a, when, so, when societies become luxurious, you know, that, that then wars uh, emerge out of that and uh, civil strife and... Um, class conflict, all these things come out of that. And that brings me to something I think really that fascinated me was the idea of sumptuary laws, which apparently were widespread all over. This idea of really limiting people's consumption. But that's, I mean, the idea, yeah, of, of sumptuary laws is really interesting. I, I was staying in... Um, my godparents uh, house uh, this is a you know, 20 years ago um, and found an old uh, catholic grade school textbook from 1952 in one of my cousin's you know long abandoned bedrooms uh, and it was a catholic geography textbook and they the section on economics was all about how in the middle ages there was you know a, a just price and um, it was looked down upon for people to spend money on themselves and so on. 
uh, and, it, and it treated the kind of modern economy with this sort of indignant tone that now people think that prices ought to be set by supply and demand and that people ought to be able to just spend whatever they've got and so on. And it was a somewhat romanticized view of the Middle Ages, but the point was at least until 1952 we were teaching this to our children that there's something really messed up about the economy that we have. Now, you know, my kids went through Catholic grade school and they used the same geography and economics textbooks as, you know, the public schools did. But once upon a time there was this idea that um, that these are moral issues, right? There's no such thing as economics as such. It was just a branch of moral, econ uh, moral theology uh, until fairly recently. And the idea that you could put a limit on things, that you could as a community kind of agree, um, whether through kind of formal legal coercive means or just by societal pressure, but the idea that you could agree um, that sometimes too much is too much um, is it just an idea that's completely foreign uh, to us? And it's an idea that's killing us, really. I mean, uh, or, or I mean, sorry, the, the, the lack of that idea is killing us, right? You know, I mean, ecological destruction uh, in a lot of ways comes from this, this brand of gluttony that um, if you got it, flaunt it. You know, there's nobody can tell you uh, what, what to consume and what uh, not to consume. Um, there is no, um, no upper limit to luxury um, if you've got it. You know, I, 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 I find that, it, and just as we kind of come to a conclusion, I, I find that our traditions address these things very profoundly. Uh, I'm, I'm really struck, uh, I think, uh, what you were saying, Dr. Anna, about just going back and looking at Aquinas and just the deep, psychology that these people had and understood and my interest and partly why we're doing this my interest is to how do how do we reintroduce um, the incredible uh, spiritual technology that our traditions have to to really uh, tuning the self uh, so that it, it is acting in accordance uh, with with uh, virtue. It is acting in accordance with with reason, with intelligence. How how do we how do we do that? I I, I find that uh, we've just we've uh, as as traditions we've lost the ability to communicate what we have, and and I'm just really interested in how we can really embody it in ourselves, but also uh, offer it to other people. It's, it's really hard because the breakdown in the Christian tradition, for sure, the catechetical breakdown has been going on for, for decades, for half a century. Uh, so if we're not teaching our own children the vocabulary of the faith, how can we expect them as adults when they're becoming they're learned and sophisticated in all these other disciplines to um, buy into what ultimately is an infantile faith because they haven't been educated? Um, it's a huge problem, and we're doing a terrible job addressing it. Uh, I just, the suffering out there, I, there's a lot of it, and I... I'm kind of, uh, I'm in Heidegger's camp about, you know, depression is, is we don't, it's too, we don't, you know, we can't indulge in it. Like it's, it's, uh, I mean, I'm committed to joyfulness uh, in spite of it all. Um, you know, our prophet was, was called the smiling one. And he, uh, you know, he, he told us to, to j rejoice. Uh, the Quran says, uh, let them rejoice in guidance. It's better than what everybody else is preoccupied with. And uh, I, I do look at, especially in this country, it pains me greatly to see uh, our young people, what they go through, uh, just the lack of guidance um, that strikes me as just extraordinary in, in these traditions. Like we really do know so much about what's causing our problems. And then 
we, they also addressed how to address those problems with that knowledge. And I just, I feel like I want to share that because I just, I've seen it in the people that, you know, when I worked in the prisons and just saw the transformations of people that, that embraced faith and, 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 and really that joy entered their hearts and they were able to do those supernatural things that, that uh, the people that are suffering without it feel incapable of doing, and they are incapable of doing. They're right, you know, I, they're right in that way. You know, um, what Anna was saying about our tradition, you know, Catholic tradition, we had practices that have been lost, um, you know, practices of confession and penance and fasting and so on that are, have largely fallen by the wayside. And one of the problems, I think one of the reasons they fell by the wayside is that we didn't uh, find the joy uh, in them. And that's exactly uh, what you're saying, Hamza. You know, we, there, um, we really need to emphasize that this is not the way of self-flagellation that we're talking about. The opposite of gluttony is not um, misery, right? The opposite of gluttony is joy. And um, and you find it in in all of these ways when you can uh, allow yourself to be uh, broken open to the presence of God. Um, and you know, Wendell Berry has an essay called "The Joy of Sales Resistance," and there's something I, I think that's the the way to to look at these things. You know, the the joy of fair trade, um, you know, consumption that reconnects you with uh, people who um, are allowed to, you know, have a dignified living uh, because of small sacrifices that you make. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's this kind of a vision of beauty and joy um, that, we're, that we're hoping uh, um, people will uh, continue to, to, to make manifest in their lives. Um, but we don't. Sometimes we don't do a very good job about that. We just kind of wag our fingers uh, at people and say, "Oh, you know, the world is going to hell." But um, in some ways, you know, that this exercise in asceticism that I do with my students is an exercise in in joy, and I think that's really what we uh, what we need to emphasize. And it is true that it that the one thing that gives us hope is the is the, at the micro level, is the, the relationships with our children, our children's friends, our students, young people who, it, it, it is absolutely true that the truth sells and that, um, that young people respond to, to religious commitments and to something, they're just exhausted by themselves, right? They're exhausted by this whole social media production of branding and all of that. And so when you start speaking in other terms, it's like they're, they've, they're in the desert and they've hit a glass of water. And, and it it's palpably happens in, in the classroom. So if there's any, if there's any uh, we have any room for hope, I'd say, I would say it's, it's young people who, who continually do respond uh, in real palpable ways, but we can do better. We need to do better. If we don't do better, we're complicit in this whole thing. I, ha I had a teacher once, he was Moroccan, and I was, you know, he was asking me about America, and, and, and I've said, you know, it's people are just so uh, constantly bombarded with uh, just everything that goes against a spiritual path. And, and he said something, and it gets to what Dr. Kavanaugh said, uh, the quote from Aquinas. He said to me, never underestimate the power of the principial nature of people. And that principial nature is that they desire to know God. And, 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 and he, he gave me, told me a story about a, uh, two Moroccan ministers that were debating in front of the sultan about nature and nurture. And so one of them claimed it was all uh, nurture, and the other said, uh, "No, the nature is 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 that's always at the at the root." And um, so he he claimed that the one who said it was nurture, he claimed that he could train cats to walk in a straight line with candles on their back, strapped to their back, because they're afraid of fire. And so uh, the day came when he was going to display this. So he comes into the court. 
and this line of cats uh, follow him. And then that, the other minister pulled a mouse out of his pocket and let it loose and all the cats ran after the mouse. So that heart not resting until it rests in God. And I think a lot of what we're seeing out there is that restlessness, which is one of the, it's, it's one of the daughters of sloth, which is spiritual apathy. Um, and so I, I think we need to do a better job at, at uh, finding that peace in ourselves and then trying to communicate that, uh, preferably with our states, but also with our statements. So I want to thank both of you uh, for just uh, coming on. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm a serious, um, uh, just a, a fan of both of your work. Uh, I, I came to know Dr. Moreland here at the Dominican College and then read her book on, on Islam and was very impressed. But I've, I've had your books for some time in my library. And so I benefited from both of you and uh, really appreciate you being with me. Thanks. It was delightful. It was great to, to talk with you both. Well, God bless both of you. And, uh, and um, I think, uh, you know, Christ began his journey in the, in the desert, according to two of the Gospels, with, uh, with fasting. So uh, we began with that statement from you, uh, Dr. Anna. And I think, I think we, we need to do more fasting uh, in, in, in a lot of different uh, meanings of that word. So... Thank you.